reach for you, honey. You reach for me. We'll do the things together only lovers do. Let the flow go on, baby. We'll do the things together only lovers do. Let the flow on, baby. Getting into each other. Yes, we'll unite. And we'll let love's vibrations lead us aright. We'll do the things together only lovers do. Let love flow on, baby. We'll do the things together only lovers do. Let love flow on, baby. Good morning, good afternoon. But in just a minute. Holding and touching, honey, let's get it on. And make a pretty baby that isn't wrong. Let's do the things together only lovers do. Let the flow on, baby. Let's do the things together only lovers do. Let the flow on, baby. Getting into each other, yes, we'll unite. And we'll let love's vibrations lead us around. We'll do the things together only lovers do. Let the flow on, baby. All right, welcome everybody to another Colonel Fireside. This one is an incredibly special one. Feels like a spiral to me. Um, not a circle, but a spiral because we have um, the exact same group that uh, was with us for the last Global Financial System Fireside with Zochi, Seb, and Rebecca. Um, but you know, six months have passed and time has I'm sure it changed us all in unique ways. And we're most importantly with an incredible new group of people uh, that are with us in KB7. And for everyone who's here today, I just wanna express my gratitude. It's been two busy weeks to begin Kernel. It is always um, high pace to begin, no matter how much we try to slow things down. And so for you to be with us today for the third fireside means that you've yourself found a way to integrate what we're trying to do over these eight weeks with your lives that are um, beautiful um, and busy in, in a variety of different ways. Um, and it means a lot. So um, we're really, really grateful. Um, and our hope is that um, this is really when it starts to slow down. For Sep and Zochi, I mean, you already know because you came last time, but again, we have with us an incredible group of humans. Um, this group, um, you can only try to describe with words, but we have some at the bottom that try to help us. There's a memory world champion with us. There is a pilot, an astrophysicist, many cultural historians, people that consider them selves information archaeologists, um, a circus artistic director, which we're going to try our best to hire at Colonel, because I think that's very important for our own uh, ability. So Josh, just so you know, that's our, our really long game. Um, and, and yes, people that are interested in exploring what um, we might do with this uh, web that we are weaving. Um, for, for KB7, I just want to point your direction, your focus in two places um, for where we are in Kernel. One is it's adventure time, <laughs> quite literally it's adventure time, which means that we hope that you've posted your adventure, you've, you've gotten a first sense of what that might be, and if not, that's also okay. Um, the lightning bolt emoji there refers to the lightning bolt in the adventure type channel where you can keep us posted on what it is that's going on. Um, and we have some quiet time for that for not only week two, which is where we are now, but week three, week four, and really in some ways week five. Um, so it's it's this like slow middle space for the kernel block where um, we hope that you just get some time to explore those things. And of course the guilds are going and there's, there's still events happening, but um, but there's no like big show 
that that we want to do we want you to have that space to kind of allow those ideas to um to go where they're they're meant to um so please uh make yourself comfortable and enjoy this um as always there's a slido and the chat and the way that everyone in the um in the zoom room is excited for the conversation to go is, is where we will try to steer it. So please um, make your voices known as the conversation flows on. I'll pass the mic to Andy, who's going to help us introduce um, the topic for this week, a global financial system, and introduce uh, Rebecca, and then move into our fireside. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's been a block of spirals. We often talk about the kernel syllabus in the sense the first kind of four modules mostly make up a look backwards, a grounding and a foundation for uh, in particular kind of modules four, five, six, and seven, which are more future oriented and that forms that part of the spiral. But even within these first few weeks, you know, last week we kind of set the scene. We talked about a play of pattern. We talked about how it applied to trust the kinds of thinking skills that we are most keen on exploring together through kernel and their application to really, really critical ideas like meaning and value as they relate to the development of Bitcoin and the appearance of things like Ethereum afterwards. And this particular module, module two, the global financial system is uh, another little part of this kind of like looking back spiral and trying to ground ourselves in a recognition of common thinking patterns across different domains. In particular, by looking carefully at the history of debt, at the idea of what money is and where that came from, at the notion of records, at what money as a social technology means, the fact that it is older than writing, the different ways that it's been applied across history in both the anthropological view and the economic one and in highlighting how even in the modern financial system with really complicated financial instruments like residential mortgage backed securities or interest rate swaps or credit derivative swaps so these kinds of things you still have this fundamental pattern of complementary opposites the bankers talk about it in terms of debits and credits assets and liabilities the t accounts that is spoken of in perry merling's course from the institute for new economic thinking on shadow banking is the bankers version of complementary opposites and i really want to just focus on that because despite the particular complexity of different fields we find the same structures coming up over and over and over again and i think a large part of our conversation today will center around this notion of balance <laughs> where are the balances to be found and how can we enact those in ways which are truly pro-social in ways which are aware of how they are perceived interpreted and promulgated through the world, not just through our ledgers, but also through the records of our stories. Because these two things have always been in some kind of interrelationship, but really the appearance of blockchains allows us to uh, hone in on the fact that money is speech. Uh, and there are very, very interesting kind of ways of excavating that in uh, different contexts. The one that we'll just touch base on here with this slide is the principles for open money. It comes from work done by a man called Michael Linton and many fantastic people around him, also based in San Francisco, where Rebecca is today. And uh, they did a lot of work, you know, sort of in the 80s and 90s, certainly a long time prior to blockchains and at the beginning of the web itself, in terms of thinking about but how we could create locally exchange traded systems and what it would mean to encourage people to play games with money that then might take on the qualities of truly uh, digital currencies a long time prior to 2009 and the appearance of Bitcoin. In particular, uh, three principles that they put forward for open money are listed on this slide. Uh, you'll see that they're very similar to what is spoken of in kernel. Our money is our word. 
uh, open money is sufficient and free, right? We often say that uh, like the mission of kernel is clearly to learn together, uh, but a sub uh, a side mission of that a little thing that happens as a result of learning together is that we can go on freeing money, uh, go on finding ways of making money free, because there is this beautiful double directedness in that word, which has both to do with cost and with something less quantifiable, uh, which we will explore next week. So that is uh, the scene for for this week there's a great deal of detail in in the modules it's primarily historical there is an anthropological bias in it and we try as far as is possible to genuinely look clearly at the way that money is practiced in the world today and how we might in understanding that properly think about the ways in which programmable money can help us improve the current systems uh, the last thing that I will say in this particular regard is Vivek flashed the modern money pyramid that Perry Merling talks about in his uh, presentation that is a part of the kernel syllabus. And one of the arguments to be made here is that you can see there are different kinds of money, just as there are different prices of money. All of these subtleties are not often touched upon. Uh, as we try and sweep aside the banks uh, with broad and generalizing statements without recognizing some of the complexity and the historical importance of these ideas. And when you do, you can recognize that, for instance, in this money pyramid that specifies the different kinds of money from Federal Reserve notes, which used to be gold, all the way down to credits, think about like the cycles of businesses and the cycles of the years. There are to seasonality, you can recognize that like Federal Reserve notes, the best kind of money, the most money like money in the world at the moment, uh, are a particular kind of money that is controlled by an unelected group of bureaucrats who are, generally speaking, very highly trained, well educated people, and yet who lack the tools and the ability, almost by definition, to truly influence the financial systems in ways that are pro-social and healthy and responsive, right? They have very, very few levers, the interest rate being the major one that they can shift uh, in order to try and uh, calm this inevitable cycle that we find in financial models across history. And one of the arguments that this particular module puts forward is that perhaps programmable money is a new kind of money that might be able to sit at the top of this pyramid and be more responsive to the inevitable booms and busts that move along with seasonality and human civilization. So that is an interesting thing to explore in your own time. I just want to really emphasize it because we haven't in previous firesides done that. And I think that it's a really fascinating idea that like programmable money is a far more responsive and adaptive and flexible kind of money that might be able to help us smooth these inevitable economic debates between the Keynesians and the monetarists, between the booms and the busts. And uh, that's, that to me seems to be a really exciting prospect uh, as, we, as we move forward. And we get there by thinking about uh, the different features of money, which Rebecca can introduce us to, and by building from the bottom up and proving the properties of programmable money as they apply in community, in relationship amongst people for whom it really matters. And then uh, the rest is almost, in some sense, inevitable. So. Rebecca, for our five minutes in DeFi, if you would, it's so delightful to have you back. Thank you so much for continuing to adventure with us. It is truly, genuinely and deeply an honor to have you participate in the ways that you do, and we love you very much. Thank you, Andy. It's so good to be back. Um, I think part of why I love doing this session is that I think we've done it about four, four or five times now, and it feels like every time we come back, um, while you know definitions might stay the same, I think the context is very, very different. And the context that we find ourselves in now around decentralized finance and where it's headed is very different from what that was, say, two years ago. Um, 
And I think what I'd really love to get out of this is just to give people an understanding of what the technological promise of decentralized finance is, as well as what that opens up in terms of how we speculate what the future of money might look like. I think Andy threw around several terms like money is language. What does programmable money actually mean? And how are we starting to see that manifest around us? And I know that Seth and Zochi will come in later with some really fantastic examples as well on those topics. So before we get into our five minutes in DeFi, let's talk about what DeFi is. And I know that Kernel attracts a very diverse crowd of people. Some of you might be very familiar with this already. Uh, some of you are just beginning to dip your toes into it. DeFi or decentralized finance, which is what it stands for, is finance reimagined in permissionless, programmable, and composable form. Now, those are three pretty meaty things. Um, by permissionless, we simply mean that there are no gatekeepers uh, mediating the different transactions that form part of a financial system. Um, now, it doesn't mean that they don't exist, but they're definitely less than in a centralized financial system. So you might notice that if you're interacting with different DeFi apps, you might not be asked things like where you live um, or typical KYC type questions. And what is interesting about this is, it, of course, does completely open up the financial system to one that is borderless. And that has certain implications. And I think we're starting to see a lot of pushback there, at least from a regulatory perspective. Uh, the second characteristic that DeFi has is programmable. And this is perhaps the most interesting, which is what Andy was touching on. Programmable essentially means that you have a universal, a decentralized universal settlement layer that removes the need for third parties to facilitate transactions. And those third parties could be the legal system, it could be banks, brokers, auditors, exchanges, and that kind of thing. Within a centralized finance, you might have a middleman contributing to the final cost at every single point. With decentralized finance, um, that a lot of that is abstracted to this universal settlement layer. And so instead, we'll see things like gas fees when using various networks. And you can trust that if it's written in code, the thing happened, it's transparent, and that's recorded on the blockchain. And that has some interesting implications as well, both in terms of what Andy was talking about, about money being more responsive, but also in painting a very accurate picture of what has actually happened. And of course, the implications of that extend beyond money, but to any kind of transfer of value or transfer of information. And then the last thing here, which is that DeFi is composable. This gets to a really nice metaphor that I love that came out of DeFi, which is that of money Lego. Imagine playing with a box of Lego box and everything just fits into each other. And you can kind of think of that when we think about the technological layer behind new forms of money and decentralized finance. There's no limit as to what can be built um, and the kinds of applications that can be created just by accumulating different pieces together. So what's also worth asking why DeFi has emerged in the way that it has. As many people know, you start with 2008, 2009, post uh global meltdown uh, of financial markets. But DeFi really has emerged as an answer to a very gated, a very expensive, a very inefficient, and a very exclusionary centralized financial system, at least ideologically. And this is something that I think is always really fascinating about crypto and Web3 and, and sort of its genesis, which is that alongside this technological innovation, there are very, very strong ideological uh, underpinnings. And what I hope we can get into in this conversation is sometimes the tension that exists between the two. Uh, Andy, if you could just go to the next slide real quick. At least in theory, DeFi, and in this case, we're looking at Ethereum, has an answer to every one of these financial functions, right? So you could think about the supply and distribution of money. You could think about the role of central banks or commercial banks or investment banks. There is a layer for that within DeFi. But of course, this only paints a financial picture. And I want us to spend a little bit of time chatting about what actually happens when you start to see money move in this direction. And here it might be worth looking back into history and looking at some of the most uh, prominent thinkers around this, right? And the spotlight that I give here is the economist Frederick Hayek, who in 1976 went and published this book called The Denationalization of Money, which seemed completely radical at the time. Um, and then in 1984, he came around and he said, well, actually, I don't think we'll ever have good 
money if it's in the hands of government. Um, there are certain ways that we can take that power, but we need to introduce something that they can't exactly stop. And what he's getting at here, it, which he prefaced in his book in 1976, is a global economy of competing currencies. Now, again, 50 plus years ago, that might have been a crazy idea. What we find ourselves in now is precisely that. Now, they may not be private in the way that we expect them to, right? Some of them are run by institutions or foundations or decentralized networks of people. Um, but the point is we now have an alternative for money. And we're getting to that place where we have to start thinking about, well, what is it that money actually complete, competes on? Is it just stability? Um, it's often an example that will be given as to why people adopt crypto or DeFi. It's that they come from places that don't have stable currencies. But is that the only thing? And I think this is where things get really fascinating because this competing environment of different forms of money uh, changes the way that we deploy it. And so on the one hand, Yes, DeFi is disrupting the supply and distribution of money, but on the other hand, this in turn will disrupt things like financial markets, the structure of organizations, right? What does it mean when you can now build in quantitative value that, that doubles as both unit of account as well as, say, right to participate or right to make decisions? I think it also disrupts funding models. It disrupts uh, different industries, such as the creator economy. But an umbrella for all of this would really just be how we measure value. Um, and there's just four brief things that I'd want to chat about here before we have a segue into SEP and Sochi. Um, these are things that I've personally been mulling over just in my own work, because a lot of what I do is around monetary design. The first one is like, you now have this psychological comfort with different currencies. Uh, a couple of years ago, a couple of decades ago, that was a pretty radical thing, right? You have the currency that you use, it's US dollars, uh, and that is defined by the state that you happen to be a part of. Now we have these way ups to make. I, as a South African, when I send money home, I make a way up of whether I will be using Ethereum or a stable coin to do that. And I completely bypass the banks. Um, the same might be said of local currency systems that are now cropping up. And some of them have been around in many places. Do I use national currency or do I use local currency, depending on the purpose of the transaction? So that's the first one, just comfort with having different currencies. The second one, and I think Andy was touching on this, is being able to simulate different economic games. Um, if you're a designer, working in DeFi and Web3 is amazing because everything is tracked. It's like one giant simulation, and that allows us to test different incentive systems and ways of coordinating in a way that we just previously weren't able to before. The third one that I think uh, I hope we do get to touch on is that we're seeing a shift in some of the design principles. So ideologically, you might say that Web3 and a lot of where we find ourselves now is designed with geographical irrelevance in mind. And I think that that's starting to change. I think that you're seeing a lot of demand from the bottom up, and this is where we might categorize things like local currency. So how do these same tools and technologies have to adapt when they're adopted by a geographically defined community? And then the fourth one, which I'll just leave here as food for thought, is that we've had about a decade of these tools existing. We've seen them at some scales in certain arenas and not in others, but we rarely, because money is a language, we rarely are at a point where we need to start changing the metaphors by which we interact with these things. And this gets to design questions around how decentralized finance is still currently seen primarily through a financial lens. It might be interesting to talk about how that changes when you start to see this convergence between money as finance, money as decision-making power, money as language. Um, I feel like that's a, an interesting philosophical train of thought, um, but I want to hand over to uh, Sepp and Zochi, because I know that um, a lot of your work has really touched on this, on money as an evolving language that we have. Um, so Sepp, over to you. I think you may be muted, Sepp. Yeah, you're still uh, muted. Uh, Sepp, I don't know if you can hear us, but you are muted currently. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, so yeah, so how do you guys want want to do this? Do you guys want to ask us questions or um, yes, you want us to jump in? Okay. I, I I can I can ask a question first up. Uh, my first my first comment is that I never met a four I didn't like. 
uh, which is uh, <laughs> thanks, Rebecca. <laughs> the, the 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 thing that I would love to ask you first, Sep, is um, this particular notion of uh, sort of the ideological underpinnings of these currency experiments is one that's really, really interesting to me. And I, I wonder if we can start there because, you know, like there's been lots of discussion about, is there an ideology in Bitcoin? And if you read the white paper, it's very difficult to discern one apart from the governor on brink of second bailout for banks paper that is included in the Genesis block. And I wonder what your perspective on the ideological underpinnings of these systems are if they have remained the same and if not how you've seen them shift over the years that you've been involved yeah that's lovely um and i can answer that in two ways um one is i can answer that generally um and the second is i can answer that very precisely in the context of the um, ideological underpinnings of cello uh, which i've been very involved with um, so generally i think um, you know, uh, I think um, I'm going to start out with money. Um, crypto is much more than money. Um, I mean, crypto basically kind of the way that I would think about the blockchain is that it is an open database. Um, and I mean, if we, if we think about like what the, in, the original internet, Web 1.0, um, like it was just an open network. Um, now, closed networks existed um, and they were intranets and they were popular and very well used. And the only difference of the internet was that it did not have, um, uh, it did not have a network administrator. But in that tiny difference was the world um, because people would all of a sudden say, hey, I, I would like to, build a website or an application, should I build it for an intranet where the network administrator could shut it down at any time or decide to like take a cut of my profits or should I build it for the open internet? Um, and so that led to kind of all developers going to the open internet. Um, and that led to more things like browsers being developed for the open internet because that's where the developers were and so on. And so you saw this Cambrian explosion of uh, of innovation simply because there was no network administrator. Um, and I would say the blockchain is an open database. Closed database exists and they're very useful. Um, and the difference with the open database is it has no database admin basically. And in that is the whole world for the same reason that in the, in the, in the in, in the network case is the whole world. Basically kind of people are like, oh, if I can build an application um, or uh, uh, where I, if I can build an application where I know that um, there is no central party that can take a cut or that can shut it down, I would prefer to build there than to some closed database. Um, so one of the things that becomes possible with an open database is money, is the creation of new money, basically. It is just one, but it's an extremely important one. Um, and, um, and I wanna kind of talk about, um, and this is kind of where I'll get to kind of uh, answering your question directly, which is, so a lot of the ideology, the early ideology of the blockchain was kind of in that mind opening idea that people can create money. Um, that it is not just, I mean, uh, basically kind of when there's a closed database that controls money, you need to really truly trust the database admin and therefore kind of governments and highly regulated institutions like banks were the people that were the database admins for money basically. Um, when you have an open database, you can create money basically. Um, and so then it's a question of, then a couple of things happen. One is it all of a sudden demonopolizes money. And I think kind of in the early days of, um, uh, in the early days of Bitcoin and, and the blockchain generally, the demonopolization of money was the real kind of emphasis. And the way that emphasis came out is 
um, is through basically saying, oh, great, this is money that's not controlled by governments, basically. And I'd say that that was, um, uh, it, I think that was not the main point. It just happened to be the most concrete case that basically kind of people oftentimes, they, it's hard to critique monopolies. It's easier to cre critique the monopolists. Um, but there are, there are monopolists who act wisely. There are mono monopolists who act foolishly and so on. Um, so it's less a conversation around like, um, uh, like for me, it's less a conversation of like, should govern governments create money? I think they should, you know? But I also think other institutions and people should have the ability to create money. Um, and I'll give you a very specific reason for that. Um, and, I'll, and then I'll pause for a second. The specific reason for that is um, uh, right now kind of arguments over monetary policy are both extremely intense, like people yell about them, like they really dig deep and believe very strongly, but they're also extraordinarily narrow. Like the, um, I, the conversation around monetary policy is should, it, should money be lent at interest rates at this percent or that percent, basically. It's never like, oh, should money be earned into existence by doing pro-social work? Or should money be backed by trees? Like none of that enters into the conversation. So you have both a very intense debate about monetary policy in a very extremely narrow range. And that is because it's a monopoly, because it affects everybody. And so the opening up of money allows for many, many experiments in monetary policy. And it allows us to re-envision kind of the base layer, the values that we want to put into place. And we do that through the experimentation of setting out values and saying, these are monetary policies that and this is a monetary policy that hews to those values. Let me pause there because I have a whole bunch more to say, but that answers the first part of your question. Of in, I have a second answer, which is kind of what constitutes the ideology behind Cello. Uh, but that is that that's my first part of my answer to you. Beautiful, question. beautiful. It's like you read my mind uh -huh, because I really would love to. Uh, just pick Sochi's mind about this first, which is say Mariana in the chat's literally written, Cello is the reason why I dropped into blockchain. And I think for a lot of people on the call, certainly in the Regeneration Guild, the principles and underlying perspective that SEP has hinted at here, the notion that money could be earned into existence by pro-social behavior, the idea of natural capital backed assets, the idea of open monetary experiments have all got a lot of people really excited. And Sochi, like one of the things which has always been so interesting to me about Celo is that with this open database, you have the notion of connectedness, right? So like this is one of the grounding things that is all about like connectedness at various different levels and in various different ways. And that seems to apply greatly to what Sep is saying about open databases, the permissionlessness of the stuff. But also there is unique purpose. And those two things to me seem so interesting because like at first blush, there are little bits like how can I both be like unique in myself and have my purpose and also like connected with others. And yet there's like such rich ground for exploration of what those principles mean in like open protocols. And I'd love to hear your perspective on, on that and how it drew you in and, and why you find yourself where you are today in Celo and in the world of open money experiments. Definitely. Um, so I, just to take a step back, um, for those of you that may not be familiar with Celo, Celo um, is a carbon negative, um, mobile first uh, blockchain. And I think what really makes Celo unique is this mission of creating conditions of prosperity for all. And I think this touches really nicely on unique purpose and connectedness. So just for context, um, you know, one of the reasons that I was drawn to crypto and to Celo was this um, potential to democratize wealth and democratize technology. This and Celo's mission is so deeply meaningful um, to me. My family is from a super small town in Mexico that didn't have running water or electricity when I went to go visit in, um, in the summer. And 
Um, I think I've seen like firsthand how access to financial tools can change lives. And I, I wanna, um, you know, uh, just go back a bit um, to this notion of unique purpose and connectedness. I think so many of us in Web3, and when I look at, you know, the faces that are in this Zoom today, I think we're all connected to this idea of how do we create something really meaningful? How do we reinvent money? Um, how do we reinvent technology in a way that can really do, um, create this like tremendous value in, in the world? But I think how, what we value and what we, what we, um, what we think is important is very unique to each of us individually. For me, it's you know having access to basic financial tools or being able to have like an education. That's my unique path. But for others um, that are you know drawn to um, climate, as an example, it may be more about you know clean um, clean water and clean and, and pristine forest. And and those are also very meaningful to me. But I think what I'm trying to say is that I think what makes us unique is 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 um, this this passion, this adventure, I think that we're all um, trying to kind of focus on when we think about like web web three. Solo was also um, heavily influenced and I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that um, Sep can also touch on this by a lot of the writings of Charles Eisenstein and really how do we create kind of value in different ways. Um, and I think this value we're seeing with some of the projects that are building on Cello, like Tucon focused on, um, you know, natural backed assets. We're looking at, you know, Ethic Hub that's reinventing DeFi as a way to give access to smallhold far farmers in Mexico. Those are some of the, the projects that inspire me the most and are very unique to some of the challenges and the problems that they're facing in their communities that they're, they're trying to address. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. They also they also happen to have the best coffee at any uh, blockchain event I've ever had. I'll just put that out there. No. <laughs> and, and, and let me add to that. That was that was lovely, Sochi. And let me add to that um, a story that I tell. I read a, a lovely book um, a couple years back called "The Hidden Life of Trees," and in the in the book, they talk. He, the author talked about mycelial networks. Um, and mycelial networks we know above ground as mushrooms, but underground for in every square foot of forest, there's thousands of miles of, of mycelial network and trees use them to communicate with one another and to share food and so on. And when you look at mycelial networks under a microscope, they look like a nervous system. Um, in fact, they are a nervous system. Um, they are a biological network that passes messages and performs computations. Um, and once you see the forest with a nervous system, uh, you can't take a look at the world in the same way. There's two particular questions that come out. One question is, we know that our own intelligence arises from the intricacy of the neural networks in our brains and our hearts and our guts. And we've seen that we can kind of replicate as a at a shallow level um, some basic forms of intelligence with less intricate neural networks um, in our computers. What does that mean for the intelligence of a forest whose, uh, whose neural networks are much, much more intricate than ours? Um, and the only conclusion that I can come to is that a forest is intelligent um, in ways that we don't yet understand in the same way that a mouse can't understand a human's intelligence. Um, so that's the first thing. That, but the second thing that comes up is what, if the forest has a nervous system, which is the organism? Is it the forest or the tree? Um, and the only conclusion that I can come to there is that we are at every level from cell to earth at the same time ecosystem and organism. Uh, we are at the same time a whole and a part. Um, and the science fiction writer Arthur Kessler had a word for this. He called it holons, um, things that uh, are at the same time wholes and parts. And he said the earth, uh, the universe is composed of interlocking holons. Um, and you don't have to kind of like know about mycelium or Arthur Kessler or holons to feel the truth of this. Like, I feel like a whole, um, but at the same time, I feel like a part of something greater than myself. Um, and as a whole, 
I need agency. And as a part, I need communion. As a whole, I have unique purpose. And as a part, I am connected to all other things. Um, and so we started there. We started with like, what does a financial system with you, uh, that embodies these two values of unique purpose and connectedness? What does that look like? And then what are the primitives that are needed in order to make that financial system true? So beautiful. It really, really is. Thank you for sharing that, Seth. Okay. I, I, will, I will come back uh, to this particular point because I think that there are some practical examples outside of also like Ethic Hub, Impact Market, Tukan that have already been mentioned by Sochi, but also work currently happening with Spirals to produce a CLI tool that is capable of routing uh, value directly from the protocol and validators to like high impact places and these kinds of practical means of it experimenting with money but there is just one more associative leap that i would like to take if you'll allow me back to rebecca which is that rebecca i know that uh this saturday oakland uh will see an experiment with the oakland roots if you'll believe it <laughs> which just seems so opposite in terms of this that the mycelial networks that seth has mentioned the intelligence of the forest the neural exchange of information and nourishment exists also in humanity by virtue of language right we can we can think of like mycelia and language and the associative and analogical links between those two things and then these languages and the way that they are enacted in community give each other like they, they share resources and information and they give us nourishment right like there's something really beautiful about coming to a line for an airplane back home to South Africa and it's a total mess because nobody lines up and you hear Afrikaans and Kosa and all sorts of chaos and you're like ah yes <laughs> home you know it's really funny so I would love to hear your take on like the application of some of these ideas on the recognition of intelligence beyond ourselves on the whole and parts in which we participate as it applies to community currencies and as it applies to the soccer match this Saturday <laughs> I'd love to hear a bit about that Thank you, Andy. This is totally not a plug for anyone to volunteer at an amazing sold out Oakland Roots game on Saturday, featuring a multi platinum artist with Oak. Um, but you know, it's funny, what really comes to mind, Andy, is that some of the tension that we experience, and, and this is both, you know, at Oak with the work that we're doing here in the East Bay building local currency, and that I've experienced before working with you know, grassroots economics in Kenya, who were doing some of the earliest examples of local currencies and, and natural asset backed money in a DeFi context. And that tension is precisely what Sep was getting at, which is that relationship between the individual and the whole. Because what you're doing is you're saying, hey, here's a radically different way to do money. And from a product perspective, if money is your product, there needs to be three things for it to work, for people to accept it. The first one is that it needs to be stable, right? So I'd like living in a place like Argentina, the price can't fluctuate between 8 a.m. and 12 p.m. Uh, the second one is that it needs to be liquid. I need to be able to go to a store and to be able to use it. Like I can go to different businesses. There's a critical mass of exception, uh, accepting, acceptance. And then the third one is that there is some value proposition beyond what we have with normal national currency, right? So even if it's got those two things, why would I use this uh, in place of a US dollar when I'm spending locally? And it's that third part that local currencies really stand out because they offer you a value proposition that says this currency acknowledges the community, right? It's not just you and your relationship with money. It's the fact that when I choose to spend in my local currency, instead of a transaction fee going to Visa, my transaction fee goes to a community pot that people in my community get to spend. And you can imagine that pot kind of growing to the size of municipal budget. And the reason I bring this up is it's, it's so interesting to see how people resonate with that. Previously, the way that money has been designed and as a result of that monopolization that Seb talked about, things like that haven't been possible. So we're kind of in this interesting stage where as we come up with these different experiments, whether it be local currencies or carbon markets or any of the fantastic and sometimes crazy things that are coming up there, is you're asking people to reimagine what money might be like. And that's not something we're very used to doing because we've never really been told that we could 
reimagine what money might be like. And I think this is where it gets the most fun. So with Oak, you know, when we go out to these local events, we during Oakland Roots, which is our local soccer team, um, a couple of weeks ago, we did one of Oakland's uh, oldest and biggest rap festivals. And we were going to the places where you're going to find the people, right? <laughs> we're not doing the crypto meetup. We're going to the rap festival and the soccer game. And, and we, we've been to clubs as well. Let me tell you, we have a whole repertoire of event experiences. I can tell you a lot about event onboarding. But what we're doing is we're recontextualizing people's relationship with crypto and Web3. And I, and I can't stress this enough, and I, I don't want to go too deep into it because it is slightly tangential and it gets to some of the design decisions that you make. But if you're trying to get people to accept and trust and, and be willing to try a new kind of money, and that new kind of money is wrapped in this technology that, now let's be honest, traditionally hasn't been the most inclusive thing, um, you want to make sure that you're being really intentional about the way that you do that. And you want to make sure that it is an experience that will feel fundamentally different from what is often a very solo journey. So I'm sure people here, when you think about the first time you heard about crypto or the first time you set up a crypto wallet or whatever it was, um, probably someone told you about it or maybe you read about it and then you tried to do it alone. And that was a particular kind of experience. And what we're doing is saying, hey, you can have one in an environment that you are familiar with, that you like, it's cool, it's dope, it's like culturally relevant. And we're not doing this saying that you're now embarking on a solo journey. Instead, you're stepping into something that's a lot bigger than yourself. It's a form of money that is for and by community. And that comes with all of its own sort of ideological visions and kind of philosophical underpinnings um, that you can then dive deeper into. So kind of getting back to that tension between what I want as the individual versus what I want in community. I think something we haven't seen quite enough of, at least in the real world with Web3, is designing for that desire to belong and be in community. What does a financial system look like that caters first and foremost for that, and then secondly, for the individual? Because most of the time, people actually just want belonging and community. And that resonates far more than a lot of the other sort of value props that we, we are very explicit about with DeFi. So I hope that kind of gets to your question. And everyone should come and volunteer at the game. It's going to be awesome <laughs> if you're in the East Bay. <laughs> Book your flights to Oakland. Yeah, sure. No. <laughs> Wonderful. It's really just beautiful to hear that. And there's so much to pick up on in that particular sharing. I think that's, you know, the notion of like being culturally relevant, of being able to contextualize money and then like form these value propositions that are meaningful in groups and can potentially even like reach the capacity of municipal budgets is a very heady vision indeed uh and it it reminds me you know like i think that's except i i <laughs> you, you're speaking about science fiction i have this wonderful book here called a stranger in a strange land which is honestly like the reason i have it is because i feel like a stranger in a strange land when i talk about finance <laughs> sometimes i'm like there's so much there's so much strangeness going on here that i wasn't necessarily deeply educated in but like there's one particular you know like the story is about like a, a human being born on mars and there's a civilization on mars they're educated by him and then he gets brought back by like a expedition that goes to mars and then he has to learn about human civilization it's a wonderful setup for a book and uh he it also so happens to be the place where grok the word grok as in like understand or drink comes from uh and so he says here then suddenly with grokking so blinding that he trembled he understood money these pretty pictures and bright medallions were not money they were symbols for an idea which spread through these people all through their world but things were not money money was an idea Money was a great structured symbol for balancing and healing and growing closer. Mike was dazzled with the magnificent beauty of money. Uh, the flow and change and countermarching of symbols was beautiful and small. It reminded him of the games taught nestlings to encourage them to reason and grow. And that like, th these are the two things that I want to kind of like touch on and, and like just bring out a little bit more is that Rebecca already mentioned like the psychology and the play uh aspect of these things as we like open money and give people the ability to create their own monies and to play around with different monetary theory with different ideas of what money should be and that might lead to 
like a certain healing of our relationship with money uh, and through a healing of our relationship with money with one another. And I wonder like these two points of like how that healing relates to contextualizing money in the sense of community and realizing re relevance in different places. Like how do, how do we, how do we build monies that can help us realize the relevance of communities and contexts? Do you have any thoughts about that? I do. Is, is the question directed to me? To me? Yeah. Yes. Um, I always have thoughts on everything. <laughs> so um, I, um, I think kind of, so um, to start out with your point, there's, there's two, um, there's two realizations that are very powerful just to kind of close the loop on kind of what I feel like is setting the stage for like what what should what are some ways that money could look like basically um, but in order to think about that we ha we have to start by kind of opening up the canvas which takes some time because uh, I mean most people for most people including myself until several years ago money was like water like I didn't think about like how to design it and so on it was just something that existed but the the first is to your point that um money is designed it's not a thing I mean uh one of my favorite stories here is that um Charlemagne when he became emperor one of the first things that he did was institute a new currency um, and then he died 13 years later the empire crumbled um, but for the next 800 years um, they used that currency even though the money itself did not circulate they use it on tally sticks basically you know um, and so it was effectively a giant local exchange exchange traded system where you had these sticks that showed how much you owed to one another basically um, and the word tally up uh, today actually comes from these tally sticks. Um, so they called it, like historians call that imaginary money. Um, but in fact, all money is that basically. So, so that's the first realization. The second realization is um, uh, there's this story that I love, which is that in the mid 1800s, there were uh, a couple of inventions around painting. Um, the first was the, the metal paint tube. Um, so it used to be that people, painters would carry their paints in pig bladders. Um, and so the paint tube actually allowed them to do things like go outside. Um, and the second was the, mer the metal ferrule. And the ferrule is this place, um, is the metal piece between the, the handle and the brush on a paintbrush. Um, and when you did it in metal, you could all of a sudden make flat paintbrushes, um, which allowed for a new kind of uh, technique called the impasto effect, where you dab the paint um, at, like quickly to make kind of a textured painting. And the combination of those two inventions allowed artists to go outside, paint natural landscapes and dab the paint um, and that led to a style of painting that we now know as Impressionism. Um, and it's really interesting that these kind of like prosaic inventions led to kind of like, like a beautiful new art form. Uh, and, and the reason for that is, but this is the story of the world. The reason for that is basically new technologies increase the expressive range of society. And when you have an increased expressive range, there's things that you can express that you were not able to express in the old paradigm. Um, and at the beginning, basically, because people, at the beginning of any of these, people um, don't recognize that increased expressive range. So they use the technology to replicate the old world. You know, like the internet at the beginning looked like a very big magazine, basically, you know? Um, and uh, and so, so but, but once you recognize that, it allows you to be really intentional. And so basically kind of the way we thought about it was we said, you know, there are three sources of wealth that are, that are true sources of wealth for us. 
that are don't that are not recognized in the existing financial system. And because they're not exist, they're not recognized by the existing financial system, they're actually attenuated by the existing financial system. The first is the unique talent of, of people. Um, the example that I give here always is Ramanujan. Ramanujan was an amazing mathematician who grew up in poverty in India and made his way to like by an amazing story to the University of Cambridge where he wrote up some of the most beautiful math that the world has seen um, that he kind of self-taught as a child in India. Um, I would argue that there's not one Ramanujan, there's probably thousands of Ramanujans. We just don't know about them because of focus on subsistence. And so for me, um, like that makes a universal basic income, not just a moral imperative, but an economic imperative. Um, so that's the first place is the unique ta uh, talent of individuals. The second place that I think of the financial system doesn't recognize and therefore attenuates is the strength of our communities. Um, the, I mean, if you go to a town where all the neighbors know each other, the kids are running back and forth across people's lawns, somebody gets sick, people drop off food, you recognize that, you can only recognize that as wealth, like, um, but there's no way, place in which that wealth is measured, basically. And, and commerce can both attenuate that, like in the same way that a Walmart tends to attenuate that wealth in communities, but it can also strengthen that. Like I have a, I live in a small town of 5,000 people. There's a main street. The main street is all local entrepreneurs. They're like, they, they're like the backbone of the community. They know everybody, everybody knows them. They sponsor the soccer teams, all of that kind of stuff. And so, um, so the second kind of, um, the second solution is community commerce. Um, and then the third thing, is the health and biodiversity of our global ecosystems. Um, and I think the economist E.F. Schumacher put it the most succinctly and beautifully that I've seen it, where, where he said, you know, um, as economists, we are very, very careful to understand the difference between capital and income. We tax it differently, we account for it differently in all places, except for where it matters the most, which is in, the natural capital that has been bequeathed as a gift to us. Um, and he says there and there alone, we liquidate our natural capital and delude ourselves to pretending that is income. Um, and so the, uh, and because economic, like money is a system of accounting, one could address that directly in a new monetary system. And so that's the third, um, the third piece, which um, uh, like natural capital backed currencies is one important piece. And I can describe it if people are not familiar with it. Um, and just more generally regenerative economics and regenerative finance is a second big piece. Um, so basically kind of, it is from those, that's kind of, for, for us, the unique purpose and connectedness led to these three areas, these three pillars, which led to the five features of money that I talked, uh, I talked about in my talk with Noel. That's beautiful. Yeah, thank you so and, much. And one last really quick thing. Those can then directly lead to technical primitives. Um, like you can say, okay, um, in order to make a UBI possible, a UBI really uh, is most impactful um, in places where people need it the most. Um, in those places, not everybody has a computer. And so you have to have a very efficient like, or you have to have very efficient like client support in order to be able to, to allow people with just phones to run an order, basically, you know. Um, similarly, kind of, uh, and natural capital backed currencies require a way to have a medium of exchange that has a reserve that could be populated by carbon tokens, uh, water tokens, um, and over time, like forest NFTs. Um, so basically kind of, I, I don't wanna to take too much time, but, but 
that led from something that's very heady and abstract, which is like mycelial networks and unique purpose and connectedness, all the way down to like the technical details like efficient like client support. Yeah, it's yeah. remarkable. Sorry, uh, but, please, um, Sochi. Yeah, I wanted to add something um, to that as well. And I don't know if, if, if many of you are planning to go to Bogota to, to DevCon, um, um, but wanted to kind of highlight kind of a project there that I think brings this to life. So there is a project called Rhoda, which is um, basically providing under collateralized loans to a group of Venezuelan refugees. And what's been like really, um, I think, beautiful about this is that you know, um, and this touches, I think, on what Rebecca was was commenting earlier as well is like the fact that where we're working, it's it's so composable, right? There are building blocks that we can build on each other to kind of create this magic that happens. And specifically with this project called Rhoda, that's providing under collateralized loans to Venezuelan refugees, is now we're seeing these communities sort of come together even in a deeper way than they had before, right? And so they're helping identify, oh, these are candidates, these are people that could really, you know, have their lives changed by having this small, this small loan. And the stories are just incredible, right? You see people that were once like literally sleeping on the street that now because they had access to a $500 loan to buy a motorized bicycle, they now have a job where they can become like a courier, right? Um, and are earning now, um, I think, you know, upwards of like double the uh, minimum wage, right? And that's really amazing. But what's also happening is they're getting together and they're learning about like financial literacy. They're talking about how to use different like savings applications, right? Other things that are kind of deeply meaningful. And so you see this community not only able to like have access to these tools, but begin to help each other um, and um, and to really kind of um, learn this this new world that they find themselves in because of the fact that they're refugees. Um, and so I, I wanted to kind of share that story because I think it really brings to life. I think a lot of what you know Sepp was talking about and also what Rebecca was as well. Yeah. You can tell that Sochi has been on one of these firesides before. She knows to get in before my question. Uh, <laughs> she inevitably has better stories than my question could have brought up. Oh. It's, it's very beautiful. And the only thing I will say to that before we move into questions from everybody else is that uh, the wonderful folks at Cello have invited Colonel Fellows who are in Bogota to a dinner uh, the weekend before DevCon. There will be uh, details of that shared in, in Colonel itself or in the Telegram group for those who are going to Bogota. So be on the lookout for it uh, because there is uh, a wonderful group of people there who I'm sure you'll enjoy hearing stories from and sharing stories with. Uh, and yeah, if we would like Vivek, I think, to open it up to questions from the Slido or from anybody who was particularly active in chat, I think. Let's do that. Sure. Thank you, Seb, Sochi, Rebecca. Thank you so much. Let's see. So <clears throat> there are a few in the Slido. I'll put the link in one more time if anyone wants to put some new questions in there. The um voices in the chat if anyone would like to might be the most um, beautiful place to start i don't mean to call on too many people without you know you having don't feel obligated but i know kelly been very active uh there was a, a lot of energy around the mycelium conversation from brennan and otherwise so i'll pause right now for anyone who wants to raise their hand or just start with a question um, and if I don't hear anything in, a f in like 15 seconds, I'll take some from the slide. All right. Thank you, Brennan. I'd love to start with you. Awesome. Um, thank you, everybody. This has been such an incredible conversation. Um, I'm really active here in Austin, ATX DAO. We're like a local group, mainly of Web3 professionals right now, um, just kind of exploring what it means to be a local Web3 community and how that connects us in a different way. And so I'm super interested to hear about your work, Rebecca, in Oakland and how Web3 feels different when it's a group of people living in the same place doing Web3 things 
versus like right now where we're scattered all over the world and any lessons you've learned about the relationships that form and maybe especially around money and trust, how that changes things, having that local lens in a system that's generally internationalized. Yeah, I'm happy to take that. And I think it also ties in with the question I saw uh, on the Slido around money and trust. I think someone asked, isn't the fundamental nature of money or currency based on trust? Um, and yes, I, I think that's true. Um, I think it's worth noting that, you know, I didn't grow up in Oakland. Uh, I moved here. And this is one of those places where a lot of the people who are here um, have a really, really strong affinity to the community. And so I will preface my answer by saying that this has also been very much a personal journey and personal lesson for me. I went from traveling the world for eight years to be like, hey, what does it actually look like to be and work in community? And I think that there's some really interesting parallels around the way that a lot of Web3 has been built and oftentimes the lifestyles of the people building them. Um, it's a very different equation when you're trying to sell a product in a community. And I use it like very you know, technical term, sell a product, but really another term for it is getting people to trust a vision of what the world might be like if we work towards that, right? It's the same thing. And what's interesting about local currencies is that you really set yourself up for ambitious work because first of all, you're working with crypto. So there's already a lot of lack of trust around that. Um, you're proposing an alternative currency, not something a lot of people are used to hearing. <laughs> um, and you're doing it in a, it's, and this is specific to Oakland's context, but you're doing it in a place where tech doesn't have the best track record of serving community. People saw the first tech wave, all these promises were made and nothing really changed. And so with that historical context in mind, it calls for very, very deep care and thoughtfulness about how you approach that. And I love that you're saying that even with ATX DAO, of course, I'm familiar with you guys. I think I saw a report that came out uh, around um, city coins. <laughs> it was kind of ironically basically saying, we don't want this local currency, but that was for other reasons, <laughs> I understand. Um, it's fun because it suddenly creates these new possibilities that you don't have, no matter how hard you try in other forms of community. There is something about physical belonging and commitment to a geographically defined location. You know, with Oak, we experienced meeting people who have been in Web3 for a while and had their own ideas around local currencies and um, the ways that this technology could serve the community that they've been ruminating on for years. They just never had the container to actually plug that into. And so what's really cool about it is it's like saying, hey, everyone who's really into crypto and Web3 and is really committed to this local community, let's take all this cool stuff and just do it here. So let's take quadratic funding as a concept and like actually do it in the real world and see what happens. Um, I think it's a... If you can if you can execute well and you can create a container that people are excited to to jump into, um, I'm personally really, really excited. And I think that this gets to a question of why like institutions such as you know places to convene as a community or whether that be adjacent to web three or if it's like web three first, these are really important. And I, I really encourage people here, just as you're experiencing kernel as this amazing community in web three, think about what that might look like in your physical community that uh, probably exists, you know? Um, can you get together with the people that are also building and start thinking about the ways that this technology can translate into our physical lives? Because quite frankly, if it doesn't translate into ownership of land and how we make decisions at a local level and how we convene as a community, then what are we doing? <laughs> I see Seb off mute. I don't know if Seb, you have anything you want to add here with a lot of beautiful questions. Go ahead if you if you do have I, any. no, no, I, I I think Rebecca answered it. I, I just want to note, like for all four of the people that we have here, like speaking, it's just beautiful. For, I know that they're all in places physically that were very intentionally chosen. And um it's interesting, Seb to now know, you know, small town of five thousand people. I think Andy's at like a thousand people or less in his South African town. But anyways, um th that's 
that's a beautiful place to begin. One thing for perhaps later coming up in the Slido is um, talking about how those community onboarding conversations go. But I want to go to Lisa next, the question, and then we go from there. Yes, great. Thank you. Yes, thoroughly enjoying this conversation. And I was curious, money tends to be tied to the word transactive, or even how we think about it through transactions, and even transactional relationships. And so I was curious from any or all of you, do you see the technological innovation and our way of reimagining money, decoupling this or expanding it? Or how do you see it evolving? Yeah, this is a, a, it's a beautiful question. Um, so, you know, um, let me kind of paint a picture of, um, like one picture of the way one can see money, basically, which is, um, I, I, you give me a gift and I say, thank you so much for the gift. Um, I, I, I don't have anything to give you back right now, but here's a token of my appreciation um, that you can use to call on me when you need, basically, you know? And so that is a tying of um, like, and, and I actually believe that, um, you know, David Graeber talks about this in his book, Debt, where he says, uh, you know, everyone says like, um, like things started with barter and then they went to money, but there's no evidence that barter was uh, like barter was existing as a widespread scale prior to money. The primary, the dominant form of exchange was gift economies. Um, and so that to me seems like an actual truth, not, not just a metaphorical truth, an actual truth as to kind of the, uh, the kind of how money evolved. Um, now, um, it has come to feel very different than that. Um, and a lot of that has been because of, uh, be, uh, because of the level of abstraction um, that has, like that money represents. And that I think, again, like goes to my earliest point about that level of abstraction is needed when you have a monopoly of money because the, you have to have the base layer most abstract money in order to fit all of the use cases. But my hope, and I'll give two examples. Um, uh, my hope is that kind of as people kind of create more different kinds of money, they can imbue that spirit, that gift economy spirit, rather than that transactional economy spirit um, into those monies. Local currencies is one great example. Um, let me kind of put forth another toy example. This is uh, uh, something that I think about, but I haven't seen done, which is uh, let's imagine you have a local supermarket who uh, uh, they want to um, give discounts to the local community, basically. One way they can do it is they can give everybody a coupon. Um, and, you know, the coupon just for their own purposes, that coupon, like, will, should expire after a year, basically, you know, and say, hey, like, if you, if you spend $50 here, you get $5 off, here's a coupon. Another way to frame that is to say, everybody gets a token um, and that token is redeemable for food um, and it expires. But you know, instead of expiring in a year, I mean, this is programmable. Why don't we exp it expire a little bit every day? And then all of a sudden you have a demerge charge community local currency uh, issued by the local supermarket um, and that's kind of brought into existence through a UBI, a local UBI. Um, and so, the, and that feels very different than kind of the transactional abstract money that we're used to. Um, so anyway, so I just wanted to bring those two up as examples. Yeah, I also just have one or two things to say on that. Uh, Cause I think what Seth is saying is really important. It's worth kind of just double tapping on it, Lisa, which is to say that like, you know, there is this notion 
based on the last 5,000 years of our history that it's like somehow like dirty to talk about money because like that's not what you do in polite conversation. Uh, and the same thing applies to like transactions. I think when like people prior to this have asked me like, oh, isn't this just like embedding transactional reality and everything and hyper-financializing the whole world? It's like transactions themselves are not bad. It's the nature of transactions and how open to understanding that transaction is. Right. So like in good economic research that is like referenced in this module and comes from a man called Peter Norvig, he shows using Python. So you can go and like play with it yourself. It's not just a research paper that you have to read, that it's not the geographic dispersal of actors, nor the initial distribution of wealth that really counts. It's the nature of transactions that determines the long term inequality within any given system. And the nature of those transactions when they are win loss is what widens the gap between those who have and those who don't and like so many of our transactions on a day-to-day -day basis are this win-loss thing right so like when i buy a stock it's and that stock goes up in values because somebody else is losing it right there's like these win-loss transactions that are taking place the whole time because the medium in which we are transaction in which we are transacting is not our own Right. Like we don't get to play with that medium. That medium is playing with us and extracting profits for somebody else. Right. And I think that that's like the point that Sepp is making is like, of course, like there are always, there's always a place for transaction, literally like that, which binds us. Right. But like money is a symbol for that, which balances and binds us. Right. And like, when you see it as that, then it's like, cool like transactions are neither good nor bad. It's just like, how clear is the nature of this transaction in any given moment? And do I want to enter into it or not? Am I forced to, am I coerced to by virtue of the system that I live within or under in this case, or can I of my own volition enter into the kinds of contracts and the kinds of transactions, which are win-win, which allow us to play infinite games, which are transfinite in the sense that like, transacting with you doesn't diminish the value that I am responsible for. These kinds of things, uh, you know, are like very beautiful transactions. Uh, and, and, and if that's a part of our reality, that's not a bad thing. I don't think uh, it's just like how clear is the implication of this transaction, which at the moment is completely obscure. <laughs> you don't think about the other person losing when you buy an ETF or something, you're just like, oh yeah, this is, this is like a good ETF. I can buy it and like secure my, uh, you know, children's education, these kinds of like very necessary and good things, but you don't think about the loss on the other side. Uh, whereas like we can make these clearer. And guys, I'm so sorry. I, for some reason I had this on my calendar to tw till 12, 15, I have to hop to a 12, 15 right. meeting. Um, no worries. No worries. So thank, thank you so thank much. You, thank you so much. Talk soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so actually, I know you may also have to go. I want to pause for that, if so. I do. Um, but it was lovely being here. Thank you for having us back and look forward to connecting more with this beautiful community. Yeah. Thank you, Zochi. Thank you so much. See you soon. See you soon. Um, Rebecca, do you also have to go? <laughs> I can stay for five. <laughs> okay. Well, there is the top upvoted question in the Slido, which asks from Jess, um, can you give us an idea of how your community onboarding conversations go? And if you will, you know, you've already, <laughs> you've already teased, there's all sorts of events that are happening in Oakland. Maybe, yeah, you can paint the picture a bit of what's going on over there for people who might want to come say hello. Sure. Yeah. Well, of course, you can always come and find out for yourself on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> but in general, um, I mean, the context is that we're building a local currency, right? So we're not a wallet or, or a some other kind of like crypto sort of retail consumer facing um, platform that we're trying to sell. We're trying to sell, hey, we're building a local currency. And in order for that to happen, we need to provide the base infrastructure so that people could use this local currency. Um, but beyond that, we also just want to like create this dialogue of letting people know that this technology exists and it can serve community if we're intentional about it. So that's kind of like the premise with which we enter these conversations. Um, and I did mention that we do a myriad of different uh, community style events. Uh, we're essentially trying to grow the Web3 graph in Oakland, right? 
Um, given that this is a place that traditionally has been left behind by tech, what could that look like if we were at the forefront? Um, and so often what we'll do is we'll partner with a local uh, kind of cultural event provider. So it might be a soccer game. It might be a um, recently did like NFT Oakland, which was convening for a lot of local artists. Um, we've done First Fridays, which is like a really big block party. So we just post up at all these events that are going to attract really big crowds. And we'll often have some kind of like incentive that they can have during the event. Um, so for example, partnering with Oakland Roots, they are doing a custom branded pair of sneakers that are like Roots branded. Um, I learned this coming into Oakland, people really care about lo local merch here. Like it's a thing, it's a whole industry and to get like Oakland branded pair of Jordans is like a big deal. <laughs> so we'll do things like that where it's like something that people care about that may not even be related to crypto. And we'll say in order to get access to this thing, um, here's how you set out. Yeah, Oakland swag, basically, Marcus. Uh, here's how you set up a Web3 wallet for the first time. Um, we've built a, a pretty decent product where we can kind of create that into one seamless five less than five minute experience and you're setting up a non-custodial wallet so you're kind of giving people a dip, a dip in the toes type of experience of what it means to interact with web3 but understand that they've gone through their first crypto experience at a physical real life event um, there is some utility to that immediately. So it's something we've done in the past is token gated commerce, where we've partnered with local businesses and kind of as a simulation or as a proxy for local currency, we'll give them an NFT that can say, give them a discount at that local provider with a portion of the transaction going into our local currency that then funds our governance rounds like we did with Gitcoin around quadratic funding. And so you're starting to build this like really small, humble circle of what that economy might look like with very rudimentary web3 tools but the important thing here is that you're not just promising some kind of pie in the sky ideal of what the future might be like you're doing that and demonstrating in real time what that feels like um, which is of course just a fundamentally different experience from say watching a bunch of youtube videos and getting completely lost by yourself so that's a little bit of color um i if people are interested i feel like we could set up a, a junto or something around like onboarding because i think about this a lot like how do you design wallets how do you design onboarding experiences like how do you make this stuff normal and uh, a pleasant experience rather than an overwhelming fearful one definitely beautiful um, I love that, Daryl. Pie in the sky and on your plate. That's it right there. <laughs> All right. There will be a Junto. There will be pie at the Junto. And we will go from there. <laughs> wow. Lots of interest in the Junto. Look what you signed up for, Rebecca. We'll get to hang out more. <laughs> um, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you so much. Um, it's, a, it's a joy. And for like there to be a rootedness to this conversation um, is beautiful. And good luck with the Oakland Roots on Saturday. Thank you. Um, yeah, beautiful. We'll see everyone soon. I'll put the link to the gather town, but thank you for being with us for 90 minutes today. We'll see you very, very soon. Thank you all.